All right, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. I'm Ed Lengel. I'm Senior Director of Programs at the National World War II Museum's Institute for the Study of War and Democracy. And I'm here this morning to talk about World War I, which is a field that I've been in for quite some time, even before coming to the World War II Museum. I've written several books on World War I. It's been a passion of mine for quite a long time. And I think it holds a lot of interest for us. It's extremely important. And there's a lot that we can find in that war that's inspiring even and informative for us. And I, I have kind of a personal stake in it as well. I'm a third cousin of Sergeant Alvin C. York, who is uh, obviously one of the major figures of the American participation in the First World War. And to me is one of the most inspiring individuals who I know, and I'll be talking about him some this morning. So I will move to my presentation. This is a new format for me, so bear with me. I know we're all getting used to some new, to some new standards here. Okay. Who were the Doughboys? We at the World War II Museum have been talking a lot about the GIs. Now, obviously, that's our mission. But the Doughboys really deserve our attention. They deserve our respect. They deserve our admiration. They were a whole generation of Americans who faced an unprecedented conflict who brought the United States onto the world stage for the first time, who, who experienced modern warfare for the first time. To me, they're, they're just a very special generation. There's something that, they're, they're a group of people who we will never see again. There's something unique in the history of our country. World War I, for most of us, has um, a kind of a, an image of being just mass slaughter, mass death. There's nothing we have to learn from it. There's, there's nothing more than to be depressed by it. But in fact, the stories of the Doughboys and the stories of the individual Americans who served in the First World War, I think, are just incredibly compelling. Uh, they're their service and the, the things that they did, the deeds that they performed, I think really have, should have a meaning for all of us. My goal in this presentation is to, to share with you something about our participation in the First World War through the eyes of four men and their experiences of this war and their experiences of what would come to be called the Lost Battalion and the Argonne Forest, I think, are typical in many ways of, of the American experience of the First World War. And I'm going to start in New York City in 1917. New York, obviously, is going through a really tough time right now. And this story that I'll be sharing with you is in many ways about New York City and New York City as a microcosm of America. When the United States entered World War I, there was a, a lot of uncertainty about New York and New York's place in America. We've, come, we've become used to thinking of New York City as being the uh, kind of, it's all about America. It's what America is, the Big Apple. You go on a normal day uh, to, to Times Square and you see all the tourists there and you see them looking up uh, and looking at the buildings and, and looking at all the displays and they, their attitude is, this is the United States of America. But in 1917, most Americans were really not sure about New York and other big cities and really 
what's their place in our country. They, they seem to, to many of us, uh, to many Americans, to seem like a, almost a foreign presence in the United States and not really representative of our country. And there was an obvious reason for that. For many Americans, this was New York. It was a teeming uh, metropolis filled with foreigners. In 1917, we stood at the peak of a wave of immigration that had been going on for some 30, 40 years of millions of immigrants coming to this country from Europe, from Southern, from Eastern Europe, even from countries like England and Scandinavia, from Asia, from China, uh, and even some from Africa. And they came to live in, in places like this, in Hell's Kitchen or in Gas House or the Bowery. And if you walked down a, a street, say in uh, Mulberry Street uh, in uh, Manhattan, you would have heard maybe a dozen different languages. You would have seen people who dress strangely, who looked strangely, they practiced different forms of religion, they ate different kinds of food, and, and lots of Americans thought that this isn't really, this isn't really us. Who are these people? They, they don't, um, do, they, do they really have any loyalty to the United States? Are they really Americans? Can we trust them? at a time of crisis. Well, that time of crisis hit in April of 1917, when President Woodrow Wilson asked Congress for a declaration of war against Germany. And we face the prospect of sending millions of Americans overseas to fight in Europe alongside Great Britain and France. Now keep in mind to this point the United States had not fought any major battles or engaged in any major conflicts outside of North America in the entire history of the country. And now here we're facing the prospect of sending millions of Americans overseas to fight in a modern industrialized war against Germany and the other central powers. Now, when we entered the war, the, the story that you'll usually hear is that there's a lot of patriotism, that everybody was eager to join up and to go overseas and to fight, and that people just were eager to get into to uniform. In actual fact, there was, there was a very muted reaction to our entry into this war. It seemed like Americans were not eager to sign up and to get in uniform. In April, from April to May of 1917, something like 40,000 Americans volunteered to join the armed forces, which is a pathetically low number. And the American newspapers and other media are filled with angst about how are we going to form an army if everybody seems to be so apathetic about our participation in this war. There were attempts to hold major parades in New York City and Chicago and other major cities uh, to, to kind of whip up enthusiasm for our participation in this war. But if you read the newspaper accounts of the time, of the time it, there, there's a sense of overwhelming apathy that young men don't show up to these parades, that uh, the Crowds that gather seem to be mostly kids who are just out to have a good time, that everybody else is concerned with just business as usual. So by May of 1917, almost immediately after we've entered the war, uh, the United States has to institute a national draft. Now that's going to mean that millions of young men are going to be uh, forcibly entered into the armed forces and sent overseas to fight. Now, that sounds fine in principle, but what about people like this? You're going to put them in uniform. These are people who have 
either themselves just arrived in the United States or their parents have just arrived in the United States. They, some of them don't even speak uh, English at all. Others barely speak English or heavily accented. And now you're going to put them in uniform. You're going to send them overseas to fight against Germany, which really has the most powerful army in the world uh, at this time, a veteran experienced force. Are these guys just going to cut and run? Are they going to fight for the United States? What are they going to do? Damon Runyon was, and this is a later photo of him, was uh, one of the most accomplished sports writers in the United States, uh, and particularly in New York City. If you've ever read his collection of stories, Guys and Dolls, uh, you'll know something about his talents and his abilities as a writer. He's a, a really witty character. He symbolizes in some ways one of the only things that unites Americans and unites New Yorkers uh, at this time in our history, which is sports. But he also symbolizes this, this kind of um, growing sense of America as being an America that's, that's made up of millions of individual stories. Damon Runyon is a master storyteller. He came to New York shortly before World War I began. He was raised in Kansas and in Colorado. Uh, he did some frontier journalism. Uh, he was a raging alcoholic for much of his youth. And when he came to New York City right before the war, he uh, quit drinking and became, took up smoking pretty obsessively, um, went to work for the Hearst Newspaper Syndicate and uh, covered the World Series, covered college football, covered horse racing, and particularly covered boxing. And when we entered the war, he becomes, he takes the lead of this new generation of journalists who may have started out in different fields as he did in sports writing, but who now have a task of covering the war. And now he's fascinated by the stories of these individual men. He's fascinated by the idea of how are you going to melt these different types of Americans who come from all kinds of different backgrounds into one organized force. And when uh, he witnesses the first parades, he sees all of these draftees from different parts of the city, guys he had come to know out on the streets who were gamblers and high rollers and newspaper vendors and street fighters and uh, fruit stand uh, operators and all the rest. He's, he's very eager to know who they are and what it's going to be like when they're sent off to fight. Uh, we'll be returning to Damon Runyon shortly. Now the question is, when you bring these guys into the army who come from all of these different backgrounds and you're not sure whether they're really going to be dedicated to the service or not, the idea arises that it's going to take a special type of American with a very passionate belief in public service to lead them. This is something called the Plattsburgh Movement. A couple of years before the United States entered World War I, former President Teddy Roosevelt, as well as some others, came up with the idea that in peacetime, the very best of American society as they saw it, the blue bloods, the, the doctors, the lawyers, the people who were uh, corporate leaders or sons of corporate leaders, the privileged in society had a duty and a responsibility to lead and to prepare for a moment of crisis and to step forward to bring the country together and to potentially lead the country into combat if we entered the war. They were sent to camps. That these were all volunteers, uh, again, from privileged backgrounds. They uh, joined up in the summertime of 1915 and 1916, and they went to camps in places like Plattsburgh, New York, which is where the, the Plattsburgh movement name came from, or to other parts of the country to uh, learn 
basic principles of physical fitness, of drill, of elementary tactics, but particularly, particularly to, to learn the sense of dedication and the sense of public service and a responsibility to lead, to take responsibility in a moment of crisis. And when the United States did enter the war in 1917, these are the men who the country will call upon to take the lead, to meld these everyday Americans, these immigrants, these people from different backgrounds into one armed force and to lead them into battle. Some examples of these men who felt this responsibility to lead, you see on the screen before you right now. One of them on the left is Charles Whittlesey. Charles Whittlesey was a very successful New York City lawyer, came from a family originally from Wisconsin, uh, then from Pittsfield, Massachusetts, went to um, Harvard Law School, and then became a very successful New York City lawyer, uh, and that's what he's doing when war breaks out. Uh, he's not a military man. He's never had any particular interest in the military. He's not a professional soldier. He never considered a military career. But when we enter the war, he feels he has gone to Plattsburgh camp in 1916. He feels this responsibility that he needs to step forward and he needs to lead. And he goes to officer training camp and he is assigned to the 77th division, which I'll talk about more in a moment. He has no obligation to sign up. He could have continued his practice in New York City. Nobody was going to demand that he join, but he decided to volunteer. George McMurtry on the right, even more so. He's already in his 40s. He's the son of a colliery operator uh, in Pennsylvania. His family were Irish immigrants, as the name would suggest. His father went from rags to riches. Uh, George McMurtry was brought up in privilege, also went to Harvard Law School, but then decides um, to become a stockbroker and uh, is a millionaire by the time the war begins. He has already served his country during the Spanish-American War. Now he's in his 40s. Nobody's expecting that he has to sign up, that he has to leave, but he has been to Plattsburgh. He has a sense of duty and responsibility. And so he does also go to camp and become an officer in the 77th Division. The 77th Division is uh, called uh, the Statue of Liberty Division. It is an all draftee division, and it is taken from draftees largely from the greater New York City area. Uh, the people who I was showing you just a few moments ago, uh, the street toughs, the uh, newspaper vendors, the um, stock exchange operators, all the rest, everyday people from New York City, uh, many of them also recent immigrants uh, who had no real roots in America are drafted, put into the 77th Division. And it's going to be up to men like Charles Whittlesey and George McMurtry to lead them into battle. The fourth of the individuals that I'll be talking about comes from a very different background, but in some ways as well, he too is an immigrant. And that is Alvin York. The scene you see on the left is from what was then the most impoverished county in the whole of the United States and remains so well into the late 20th century. It's where my mom's family comes from, which is Fentress County, Tennessee, way up in the mountains of Northeast Tennessee. These uh, people, they're, they're a special brand of people. Uh, they're descended from Scots-Irish immigrants who moved up into the mountains in the early 19th century, who were uh, deeply involved in the uh, guerrilla fighting and the Civil War. Many of them were diehard uni unionists, uh, but they were people to whom community meant everything. 
and to whom family meant everything. Uh, but they didn't have much. Uh, hard scrabble farmers, for the most part, and very, very isolated. They're people who, uh, for whom faith is extremely important, for whom storytelling is extremely important, but they're also people who are familiar with and comfortable with violence. And they're accustomed to hardship. And they're, they're accustomed to, to dealing with tough times, as on the picture on the left is taken in the Great Depression. Alvin York is, is one of those people. He is uh, raised uh, in uh, violent circumstances uh, as a teenager. He becomes uh, involved in essentially a gang, uh, gets involved in, in uh, drunkenness and fighting. Uh, he sees uh, a man who he knows well knifed to death uh, right next to him in a, in a bar fight. And like many of these people, he, he tries to turn away from that violence uh, that's a part of his upbringing and that poverty that's, that's part of his upbringing. And he tries to find something uh, that's meaningful. And he joins as a young man a uh, very Bible-focused uh, denomination of, uh, uh, of Christians uh, and, and becomes devoted to his faith and, and tries to, to use that as a means of turning away from violence and turning away from the past. And those of you who've seen the great movie uh, Sergeant York with Gary Cooper know uh, from 1941, know a little bit about the story, although the movie kind of stylizes it and, and makes it a little bit into a, into a cliche. But um, York did as... Uh, the United States entered World War I. He had no interest in joining the military. Uh, he was deeply concerned about whether uh, he could, by, by the terms of his beliefs, whether he could kill a man in battle. But, but his, his, his feelings were complicated. Uh, if, you, if you read some of, his, um, some of his writings, he says, you know, I'm, I'm not afraid to fight for my country. I'm willing to fight for my country, but I, I just need to know why. I need to understand what I'm fighting for, and, and if, I, if I have to kill in battle, then, then I will, but, but I need to know what I'm fighting for. I think, though, there's something to your, that's a little bit more complicated than that. I think that, that he was afraid of himself. I think that he was afraid of, of what was within him. He was afraid that when he entered into conflict, if he entered into a fight, that something would trigger there, that, that something would unleash what was inside of him, what came from his past, his violent past, and that he would return to who he was. And that everything that he had tried to build up, the edifice of his faith, the, the edifice of, of his, his belief in, in God and, and family and, and everything else would kind of fall away. And he would become that monster that he believed that he once had been. Uh, and as you'll see, that's kind of what happens in the Argonne Forest in 1918. I could say a lot about the United States and in World War I, as I say, I've written several books about it, but let me try to, to narrow it down to a couple of points. When America enters this war, we have a tiny army. Our regular army is scattered all over the world. It's one of the smaller armies in the world. We have very little basis for building up a, a major combat force, especially for one to be deployed overseas in a modern war. Even though World War I had already been going on for a few years, this country was totally unprepared, absolutely and totally unprepared for a major war. We had to build an army from scratch. We had no arms industry. We would have to rely on the French and the British to build our tanks, to build our heavy weapons, to build aircraft, to build everything else. This is totally different from World War II. We're building an army from scratch, but we're also psychologically unprepared. 
You see on the left of your screen, General John J. Pershing, General Charles Summerall to the right, who would become the commander of the First Division. Pershing is a believer in what in other times was called the cult of the offensive. He believed that it was the individual American soldier and his will to victory and his ability, his proficiency with the rifle and the bayonet that would win the war. He believed that the Europeans had dug into their trenches. They'd come to rely on artillery, machine guns, grenades, poison gas, and all the rest, and that in some respects it had corrupted them. It had degraded them so that uh, they became used to living in the trenches. Pershing passionately believed that Americans were special, that there was a special American way of war, and that when we brought our soldiers to the Western Front, that we must attack, attack, attack. It was the American willingness and desire to attack and to remain on the offensive and to refuse to become bogged down in the trenches, to refuse, as he called it, to become corrupted by the European way of fighting that ultimately would win this war. And the result was for the Doughboys when they arrived on the Western Front is that they're going to be thrown pretty quickly onto the offensive and into the attack with very little preparation, with very little training, and with often ineffective support. Charles Summerall, as, as you see here, was an advocate for, for uh, the use of massed artillery, but he was different from uh, many of the other American generals in supporting that. Uh, most of them believed that the priority was simply send the infantry forward, dominate the battlefield, bring the fight to the enemy, do not sit in the trenches. And in fact, if you ever hear an account of Americans going over the top in World War I, which suggests leaping out of the trenches and assaulting, that's uh, inaccurate almost entirely because Americans did not dig trenches. They were supposed to keep attacking. The cost was high. One thing many people don't realize is that the largest and the bloodiest battle in the history of the United States was in World War I the Meuse-Argonne Offensive from September 26 to November 11th, 1918, with almost all of the fighting taking place in the first three weeks. In three weeks of fighting, 26,000 Americans killed with over 100,000 other casualties. Now think about that for a moment. That's in three weeks' time. That is the largest and the bloodiest battle in the history of our country. That's over half the combat deaths of the entire Korean War. It approaches half of the combat deaths of the Vietnam War. That was intense. So any um, impressions that some people have that America didn't really have any significant participation in the First World War, that's wrong. And certainly by the scale of British and French participation in the war over a much longer period of time. Yes, we were not in the fighting for as long as they were, but for the time that we were there from about May to, the, uh, to November of 1918 when American troops were in combat, they were deeply involved in combat. And the scale of the casualties is about the same as for the British or the French or the Germans in the battles of Verdun and the Somme over the whole course of those battles. The 77th Division, which I had been describing earlier with Charles Whittlesey and George McMurtry and with uh, great reporter Damon Runyon watching them first from New York City and then going over to France to report on their actions at the front. The 77th Division is placed in the Meuse-Argonne Offensive in terrain like this that you see it in front of you right now in France's Argonne Forest. Now keep in mind, this is the first all drafty division that the United States has ever sent into combat, ever. And 
It's now being placed in the Argonne Forest in the toughest part of the German lines with orders to assault essentially straight ahead into terrain like this, which the Germans have heavily fortified and make no mistake, even this late in the war, the Germans are still fighting hard. They are experts, they understand the terrain, they understand defensive fighting. And you're sending an essentially green division, seeing a little bit of fighting before this, but not much to assault straight ahead into terrain like this. And it's up to men like Charles Whittlesey, who becomes a major, the 308th Infantry Regiment, and George McMurtry, his captain, to lead the advance. October 2nd, 1918, Charles Whittlesey leads his battalion into the Argonne Forest with orders to attack, attack, and attack, maintain the advance. He is told, don't look to your flanks. Don't look to support from the flanks. Don't stop. If you don't see anybody to your right or to your left, assume that somebody will come up in support of you later on, but don't stop and wait for them. You have an objective to take. You need to take it without waiting. I'm not going to get into the tactical details of, of this action uh, because my purpose here is to talk about the men and their story. Whittlesey with McMurtry and elements of several different companies from two different battalions of the 308th Infantry Regiment, 77th Division, assault into the Argonne Forest. They're pushed back multiple times. They take heavy casualties. And finally, in the morning of October 2nd, simply by accident, there's a gap in the German lines in the forest. The Germans have mixed up their forces a little bit. They've redeployed some units elsewhere, and they've accidentally left an opening in their lines. They're not aware of it. Whittlesey's not aware of it. He advances through the gap, not even knowing that it's a gap, pushes forward to his objective on the far side of a ravine and walks up, uh, leads his men up a steep slope and digs in. And only later that evening does he discover that indeed he has no support to his left or to his right, no support to his rear. His supporting units on the right and the left have been stopped by the enemy. And by that evening, as the Germans realize what's happened, they seal the gap and they surround Whittlesey's force of about 600 men from several different companies. Over the next several days until relief comes, these 600 men will be surrounded on all sides. They have no food. They have the only water that they can access is from a spring at the bottom of a slope that's under enemy sniper observation and men get shot trying to get water out of that spring and uh, they have no medical supplies and German uh, infantry and eventually German elite stormtroopers attack them from all sides with uh, grenades, with flamethrowers, uh, with every weapon that they can bring to bear. Partway through the uh, fight, the, uh, what comes to become the Lost Battalion is taken under fire by its own artillery. And you can imagine a friendly fire incident is one of the most demoralizing uh, experiences that anybody uh, in action uh, can have to deal with. Uh, the story is uh, that Whittlesey has uh, several uh, carrier pigeons, which are his only means of maintaining communication uh, with the rear. Uh, there was no reliable wireless communication in World War I, uh, and certainly they couldn't lay telephone lines into the pocket. He had been trying to use runners to get information to the rear uh, to try to get support, but uh, those runners are uh, 
are picked off pretty quickly and they're surrounded. So Dulce has been sending messages back to division by carrier pigeon. Uh, and it reaches the point uh, that he only has one pigeon left. Now, the uh, pigeon handler is a French-Canadian. Uh, he saved his favorite bird for last. Uh, he names it Cher Ami. Now, they're, uh, as they're taken under fire by this friendly artillery bombardment, uh, Whittlesey, ordered, Whittlesey uh, writes um, a, a message back to division saying, we're being hit by our own guns. For God's sake, stop them and wraps a, um, the message around Jeremy's leg. It's the last pigeon that he has left and releases the pigeon. And the pigeon, is, remember they're under heavy fire, uh, there's shrapnel flying everywhere. The pigeon flies up into a, into a tree and perches on a nearby branch. It's confused by what's going on and it's preening itself. And uh, the pigeon handler has to like shimmy up the tree. They try to throw rocks and sticks at the pigeon to get it to go. It won't go. And finally shakes the branch. And the, uh, the pigeon flies off and gets hit by shrapnel and flutters to the ground somewhere that they can't see it. Nevertheless, within a short time, the artillery bombardment stops. In fact, Jeremy has taken off again. Uh, the bird has lost a leg, not the leg the message was on, fortunately, uh, and has taken shrapnel on the breast, but somehow it gets back and gets the message. Uh, that's a legend the, that all happened, but likely the artillery was stopped even before the uh, pigeon made it back. But the, um, their ordeal continues. Now, the, the scene you see in front of you right now, uh, one of the, the most difficult uh, aspects of this battle to deal with is that in 1919, after this battle was over, many of the veterans of the Lost Battalion, as they came to be called, were sent back to France to participate in a silent movie, the filming of a silent movie of the Lost Battalion on the very spot where this battle took place. So imagine if you're a combat veteran, you've gone through these traumatic experiences and you're sent back to reenact what you did for a movie, for entertainment, uh, which is what happens. This is a scene from that movie. These are actual Lost Battalion veterans reenacting uh, what they experienced there. But they have, despite all the things they don't have, there are some things they do have. And one of those is each other, as again, you can see in this, in this picture. These are guys who came from every imaginable background, every imaginable ethnic background. If uh, a couple of years earlier, if they'd seen each other in the streets of Manhattan, they might well have crossed the street just to beat the crap out of each other. I mean, these are, these are not people who are naturally friends. All they have, all they have in common Right now, it's a city that they came from and uh, the uniform that they wear. And it was really difficult to meld them together. And even more so, shortly before they entered the pocket, the United States Army and its wisdom had interjected a bunch of uh, Western farm boys into this unit as replacements. Uh, these were kids who came from Nebraska or Nevada or Idaho Many of them didn't even know how to fire rifles, and now they were forced into this unit with these uh, Brooklyn boys uh, and kids from Hell's Kitchen, uh, and they have nothing in common. But under the pressure of combat, they come to depend entirely upon each other and to rely upon each other. And all of the accounts of this battle show that they bonded together with each other so profoundly that they would literally do anything. Uh, to help a wounded buddy. And another thing that they have is their officers. Men like on the right, Charles Whittlesey. Whittlesey was not a soldier. Whittlesey was an intellectual. You know, as you can see, you can look at him. He was a man, though, who had this passionate sense of duty and responsibility. And during the fight, he doesn't sleep. He never goes to sleep. He crawls for four, day, four or five days from shell hole to shell hole, trying to buck up his men, trying to support them in his own clumsy way. 
The only time he does briefly fall asleep is when he crawls into a, a foxhole, they called them funk holes in those days, with a wounded private uh, to try to console him uh, overnight. Whittlesey briefly falls asleep and when he wakes up, uh, he finds that the private has died and they're sitting there cheek to cheek. And that's something he would never forget. But his example is a shining example. Uh, George McMurtry as well stays with the men as a rock and as Whittlesey's rock. McMurtry is wounded over and over again. Whittlesey is never wounded, not seriously, but uh, McMurtry is wounded several times. Again, this millionaire stockbroker uh, shows utter and total selfless dedication to his men so they know that they can rely upon him. Where does Alvin York come into the story? Alvin York has been assigned to the 82nd All-American Division. He is sent in a flanking maneuver into the Argonne Forest uh, along with uh, the rest of his division to relieve the Lost Battalion, to hit the Germans in the flank and to force them to withdraw. Well, if you've seen the movie Sergeant York, you know the story. York, uh, in an individual exploit, uh, along with some members of his platoon, surprises and fights and captures 132 Germans. But in the process of this fight, he has to kill several of them. Uh, he uh, is an expert marksman. He is attacked by, he, uh, He's with a group of Americans who have captured some Germans. They're taken under German machine gun fire. York crawls up, uh, finds a perspective to look down on the German machine gunners and picks them off one by one with his rifle. Germans then assault him uh, and he picks them off one by one with his 45. And finally they surrender. But even after they surrender, a couple of Germans, including one teenage boy, try to play hero and York shoots them to death right in front of his eyes. That thing that he had feared the most had happened, something had triggered within him, and he had become that killing machine, hearkening back to his violent past. Damon Runyon appears upon the scene because uh, York's action had played a big role in relieving the Lost Battalion, and the Lost Battalion is finally relieved after several days in the pocket. And as the men are sitting in the, in the woods and they're exhausted, only 200 of the 600 men are still standing who went into the pocket. Only 200 can walk out. Damon Runyon, who has followed them all over from New York City over to France, is among the first to interview them and uh, walks into the woods and talks to Whittlesey and talks to McMurtry and talks to the men and listens to their individual stories and brings their stories back to New York City and writes a number of columns describing what they did there, what the Lost Battalion did there. And he said, their stories are your stories. Each individual story you see here is a little microcosm of America. Now to wrap up my story, what happened to these four men? As you can imagine, uh, the things that they had experienced there in the pocket, for all of their heroism, for all, of their, for all that they had accomplished there after the war had ended, it definitely left its mark upon them. And you see here George McMurtry on the ship bringing him home. And all you really have to do is look at his face to see what he felt, to see what he experienced. Charles Whittlesey as well, the war and his experiences have left their mark upon him. And Alvin York, if you find the pictures of Alvin York that are not kind of posed, uh, because when he got back, he was such a celebrity, you can still see that he's a haunted man. Uh, he, he, he's deeply troubled by survivor's guilt. After that battle, after his experience, he went back to the battlefield to try to find a survivor, American or German. He didn't care how because he felt nothing but guilt about what he had done there. I uh, couldn't find any survivors. He's still carrying that load. Each of these three men, McMurtry, Whittlesey, and York, have received the Medal of Honor, and they're treated like celebrities when they come back to the United States. 
And those of you who've seen the uh, great uh, World War II movie, uh, Flags of Our Fathers, as well as the other movie, uh, Letters from uh, Iwo Jima, um, but Flags of Our Fathers especially, you, you understand you know, the, the uh, deep conflict that these men felt, and they're treated as heroes, but they don't feel like heroes. They're treated as celebrities, but they don't feel like celebrities. For these three men, it, it all kind of comes to a, to a head November 11th in 1921 at the internment of America's unknown soldier in Arlington National Cemetery in Virginia. Medal of Honor recipients from World War I and several wars are placed on a podium to watch the internment of the soldier and as uh, who is unknown, who may have come from any front in that war. And as uh, Whittlesey is sitting next to McMurtry with Alvin York nearby, Whittlesey turns to McMurtry and says, um, I cannot help but feel that that's one of my men. And I'm going to hear them tonight. And he's so um, deeply troubled by what he had experience there and, and a feeling of despite his own heroism his selflessness his responsibility and his giving he can't forgive himself for every man that he felt that he had left behind and so a short time afterwards he uh, boards a steamer bound for cuba and um, halfway through the voyage he in the middle of the night he steps overboard and he ends his own life because he can't, he can't bear the, uh, the memories. And that's a tragic story, and it's a tragic story that uh, is true for so many veterans. George McMurtry devotes himself to the survivors of the Lost Battalion, to the survivors organization. In these days, uh, there, were no, there was no serious government support um, for survivors, but McMurtry, uh, like so many others, devotes himself to the, to the descendants organization well into the 1950s. Um, and at the end of each meeting, he raises a glass uh, and he says, hearkening back to something uh, Whittlesey had said when they won out of the pocket, he says, gentlemen, we will never be in finer company than we are today. But Alvin New York now, and I come back here uh, to, to end my uh, presentation, Alvin New York does something really special. And here's a man who, again, also is haunted, but he's also treated like a celebrity. Everybody says he's the most wonderful American soldier ever. He doesn't want to hear about it, but he also understands he can use it in some way, and he can use it to heal himself and to heal others at the same time. He becomes utterly dedicated for the rest of his life to taking every penny that he gets from that movie, from a couple of biographies that are written of him, every penny he gets from celebrity, he devotes to charity, to helping to raise up the poor people of East Tennessee in the Alvin York Foundation. And it's there that he finds peace. He's able to take this great suffering and to turn it into good, to turn it into hope, to turn, to turn suffering into something that will make the world a better place. And I can tell you, I have met Alvin York's family uh, and his son, his son is still with us. They're the happiest, most joyful people you could ever meet in the world. And they looked at Alvin York as an example. Now here's where I'll end coming back to New York City and then open it up for questions. Damon Runyon, somehow uh, the master storyteller is able to pull it all together. He passes away in 1946 of uh, throat cancer from all of that chain smoking that he had been doing. He had become during the war great friends with Eddie Rickenbacker, the great American ace, who then uh, would go on to start his own uh, airlines. And um, Damon Runyon has it written in his will that Eddie Rickenbacker will take off in an aircraft. This was totally illegal, but Runyon didn't care. Uh, with Runyon's son, fly over Manhattan and tip Damon Runyon's ashes over New York City, as he called the city that's been good to me and the city which I have loved so well. And there's something in that gesture that Runyon was pulling together the war as represented by Eddie Rickenbacker, the city, and all the particles of those individual stories of, of that strength uh, 
of the diversity of the background of where all of these different people had come from and how this crisis and how this, this great trial had brought them together uh, and had brought the city together and made the city something representative of America. And I think that example is something that can still stay with us today. And so with that, I will end my presentation and open it up for questions. Let's see what we've got. All right, so I've got a question right off from uh, Battles of the First World War podcast, uh, which is a great podcast, by the way. Uh, let me just open this up here. Um, how did the experiences of Major Charles Whittlesey and his first Italian 308th Regiment in the pocket prepare his prepare him and his men uh, in the small pocket. Pardon me, uh, prepare him and his men for the lost battalion pocket. Now that was a uh, the small pocket was an episode I didn't mention in my presentation that happened uh, a bit earlier uh, toward the end of September. Now remember the um, the actual lost battalion episode began on October second. There was another episode uh, in September, I think, 29th, 28th, 29th, where the 77th Division had been fighting in the Argonne Forest for a few days at that point. And uh, Whittlesey and his men are cut off uh, briefly uh, in what was called the small pocket. Um, it lasted for, I think, a day. Uh, before they were relieved, um, and it was kind of forgotten later on in the experiences of the big pocket, the lost battalion pocket. Uh, so yes, uh, certainly um, Whittlesey, Whittlesey uh, learned from that experience in the small pocket, but if anything, I think the, the, um, it was a negative experience. It had a negative value um, because Whittlesey was relieved fairly quickly from that first episode in the small pocket in September um, because he had gotten through that without really communicating very much with his men, um, that he had simply waited for relief and then been relieved. I think it, it created at the beginning of the actual lost battalion pocket on October 2nd, a kind of a complacency initially. And the thought that, well, if I just hunker down, we dig in at the edge of this ravine on this very steep terrain uh, and wait for relief, that um, that relief will come. And uh, that he didn't really need to communicate too much with his men. So it took him in the actual lost battalion pocket a couple of days to realize, oh, wait, this is not like the experience I had before. Uh, this is different. Uh, and I'm going to have to handle this differently. Uh, so, so it's a good question, uh, but the but the experience was was not necessarily beneficial for him. Now, this is uh, the next question I get. I get this question pretty often, uh, and it's a good one: is how do I rate the movie on the Lost Battalion starring um, Ricky Schroeder? That came out, I think, it was called the Lost Battalion. It was a made-for-TV movie came out, I think, in the early 2000s, something like 2003. I think it's a pretty good movie, actually. It's, it's not bad. Now, as a historian, uh, as you can expect, I'm going to grumble and complain about some things not being quite accurate. I think the, um, the battlefields look kind of silly. The trenches look kind of silly. I noticed looking at the uh, battlefield scene, it seems like no two craters ever actually overlap. It's like they've been laid out uh, and the trenches that, that are created are, are kind of too perfect. But Rick, Rick Schroeder actually did a good job of portraying Charles Whittlesey and the actors uh, that portrayed George McMurtry and many of the others did a good job in it. The movie does a good job of showing um, how the men of different backgrounds came together in the pocket uh, and how that, that unity saw them through. Um, let's see. I have a comment uh, that it seems to me that General Blackjack Pershing had the same philosophical concept toward tactical warfare as British General Field Marshal Douglas Haig. Um, who led British forces in, in World War I. 
there's a lot of truth to that. I would draw the the parallel even more closely, though, with the uh, French in 1914 and their cult of the offensive. Uh, the belief uh, at the beginning of the war that uh, it's the the will of the individual soldier to win, his desire to dominate the battlefield, uh, and the individual soldier with his rifle and bayonet that will uh, force the victory. Uh, that was a concept that was washed away in, uh, in blood in um, something called Plan 17 uh, in 1914, or the Battle of the Frontiers as the French assaulted the German lines head on and were killed in their hundreds of thousands. It, to me, it's shocking that, um, that Pershing and others didn't seem to learn from that, that uh, the American uh, commanders kind of, kind of just assumed that they could wish away uh, the lessons that the Europeans have learned, that we were going to come into this with kind of a fresh perspective and that we really had nothing to learn from the past. And the um, initial American, um, you know, involvement assaults in, uh, in, West, in France in the spring of 1918 showed how bankrupt that idea was of the cult of the offensive. Uh, and nevertheless, at places like Belleau Wood, uh, where the Marines assaulted head on with tremendous bravery, but taking tremendous casualties as well uh, into Bello Wood. Uh, the lessons just were not learned. Um, and Pershing, I have great, now let me, I don't want to put down Pershing too much. I have great respect for him. There was a lot that he did that was positive. Uh, he, he was inspirational to many of his men. He was a, a dedicated officer. He cared about his soldiers, uh, but there was a rigidity to his thinking uh, that I think made him less than an able tactician. All right, Ryan Bailey writes, uh, thank you from two high schoolers watching. And that's great. Hey, thanks, Ryan. And I, I hope you've uh, enjoyed it so far. Uh, keep in mind, I think, for, for young people today, I, I think that experiences like this um, have a lot of lessons for us. And I think especially the concept of dedication and uh, social responsibility. Now, John Resto, and hi, John, uh, we're friends already. Uh, John would like a comment on the 369th Harlem Hellfighters. And so I will uh, kind of, I think, wrap up my presentation with that. This is an important topic, African Americans in World War I. And how do I, how do I kind of tie it up within just a minute or two? <clears throat> This was one of the most profoundly uh, racist times in the history of the United States, uh, in many ways even more so than during the 1860s. The, uh, the production of the 1915 film, Birth of a Nation, as well as other elements in our society at that time had led to the rise of the Ku Klux Klan uh, and to lynchings and to persecution and violence, tremendous racism against African Americans that transferred to the U.S. Armed Forces. And it's something that was pervasive at the time. Uh, African American volunteers were not accepted, um, but draftees were. African American officers were trained, junior officers, but in almost all circumstances were never sent to the front. Now, African Americans were organized in two all black divisions. Initially, they were used wholly as laborers, uh, but the NAACP, as well as other organizations, uh, really pushed for them to be sent to the front to be tested at the front, to show what they could do, despite the fact that so many of these men were draftees, they were eager to serve and they were eager to prove themselves. But they had two different, very different experiences. The 92nd Division 
was maintained under, <clears throat> pardon me, under American command. And in fact, a regiment of the 92nd Division served just to the west of the Lost Battalion at a place called Binarville. It was under all white officers. Uh, they were very poorly trained. The morale was very low. And the officers were, for the most part, incompetent. Uh, and a few days before the Lost Battalion fight took place, this regiment of the 92nd Division essentially fell apart uh, under fire and withdrew. Uh, it wasn't routed, it more was just so poorly organized uh, and its morale was so low that it, it simply fell back after the battle. And a lot of racist American uh, officers kind of pointed to that to say, hey, look, it, this just shows you that black people can't fight. The other division, however, the 93rd Division, was placed under French command. And the French were delighted to have an African-American unit <clears throat> serving with them. And this was the, uh, the Harlem Hellfighters, or as they were more often called the Harlem Rattlers. Uh, that was their original name, the 369th Regiment, was part of the 93rd Division uh, that fought uh, in other areas of France, particularly in the Champagne region of France, uh, not in the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, but near the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. These were men who fought uh, very hard and they fought with, uh, with great dedication. And um, they, nevertheless, their, their uh, accomplishments were denied and overlooked. And it wasn't until many decades later that uh, men of the Harlem Hellfighters would rightly receive the medal, medals of honor that were that were due to them. Uh, so there are a few great books about the Harlem Hellfighters, which I which I highly recommend. Their story is is a wonderful story. Uh, just quickly, somebody asked me. Uh, Larry Barker wants to know if the pigeons received a medal for their services. Uh, Cher Ami was uh, certainly lauded as a great hero, and if you go to uh, you go to the uh, Smithsonian. Uh, Museum of uh, American History, National Museum of American History in Washington, D.C., you'll be able to see uh, Cherami on display there. Now, I'd like to uh, remind everyone to please tune into all of the museum's webinars, especially next Wednesday's uh, Institute for the Study of War and Democracy team discussing our historical research services and how we help people find their loved ones in World War II history. And I thank you very much for your attention.